Okay, Rupert, David Letterman hasn't been on CBS for years, yet his merchandise is still killing it. The only place that you can get official Letterman, Late Show with David Letterman merchandise is right here at the Hello Deli. How do people get this merchandise other than coming in here? Obviously, you want to come in here. If you're in New York, right. come to the Ed Sullivan Theater, come to uh, the Hello Deli, get yourself a Paul Schaefer sandwich uh, or something else, and then buy some merchandise. If people can't make it to New York, what's the best way to get some of this merchandise. Well, they can get on my website, um, hello-deli.com, yep. and order it there. Now, do you pack that yourself? Do you pack it, uh, this merchandise, and send it off to people yourself? I, I do. Okay, yep. if um, if people ask you to add onions to the order, will you add onions to the order? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. That sounds great. Uh, the Hello Deli is the sponsor of the Letterman Podcast. We are so grateful for that, Rupert. We're so grateful for you. And my pleasure. on a personal note, thank you for the years and years and years of entertainment that you have brought not just America, Thank I'm Canadian, you. but brought the world. Thank you very, very much. My pleasure. Thank you for watching. Absolutely. La, 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 la. Welcome once again to the Letterman Podcast with Mike Chisholm. I am so excited to present part two. Now, some of you might be saying, hey, wait a second. He's wearing the same clothes he was wearing in the intro. For part one, yeah, I shot, I'm shot. i shooting the intro for part one and part two at the same time. Uh, you know, I'm efficient. I'm synergistic. No, I'm not synergistic. This isn't synergy at all. This is just, you know, uh, efficient planning and, you know, killing two birds with one stone. Um, <laughs> Morty part two, here we go. Uh, we're going to find out right now. Is it the late show? Is it late show? Um, leading into stories about... <laughs> Bill Wendell, uh, which are very, very funny. Uh, the bombshell. Who almost bought worldwide pants? There was talk of worldwide pants being purchased. Who buy? Um, Don Giller is in this episode a lot more as well, which is just, I, I love that so much. I think you all know the affection I have for Don and what he has done for all of us as enthusiasts of uh, David Letterman and company. This is a fantastic continuation of a fantastic conversation already. Uh, very, very exciting stuff. And um, yeah, I, I just, let's, 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 let's do it. Here it is. Robert Morton part two. Um, okay. I got to ask you a question. This is just a, just a one-off. Is it the late show or is it late show? Late show. No, the. okay. Okay. No, the, did you, did, would you ever get mad at, at Wendell uh, if, he, if he called it The Late Show? Because they did. <laughs> he had so many reasons to get mad at Wendell. <laughs> that's me setting it up and that's you spiking it right there. There I we go. Thing. Wendell was a nice man. <laughs> yeah. And then, God rest his soul, he, yep. he, he was a very nice man. He had a very nice family. He had a lovely wife, a lovely daughter. He had a son. Uh, you know, and he was a, a good guy, but he was one of the old school, old, old chummy guys who, you know, used to go to the New York Athletic Club, which, you know, I never liked because it was an anti-Semitic club, supposedly. Yeah. You know? So, you know, he was, he would, and, and he would steal pies. He'd come back to the office and he'd have this gigantic pecan pie. And he goes, I took this from the club. You want it? I said, <laughs> Sure, I don't care. I like pecan pie. And he'd bring pies and he'd bring things and he used to steal them from the kitchen at the club. Yeah. So when we took over at CBS, we owned the show. Yes. It was our show. So every penny of it was from our pocketbook. And the more money that we had to put out, the less money we made. Yep. The less money we had to do the show, the less money we had to travel, the less money... You know, we were on a on a tight budget. It was a good budget. And Wendell used to go into the storeroom and you'd see him walking out with a case of bottled water. <laughs> you know, the Evian water, but in, in a 24 pack. Yep. But Bill, where are you going? Oh, I'm just going to take this home. No, oh, it's uh, NBC. No, no, CBS doesn't pay for it. We pay for it. Yeah. Please don't do that. And then after he did it repeatedly, you know, it was one of the chits on, on, on Wendell's record. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've heard you talk about the, the flatulence thing. <laughs> yeah. Malkoff and I are delighted to this day about that. And, and I had dinner last night of all with uh, Doug Herzog. Do you know Doug? 
I had, dinner, of, yeah. I had dinner with Doug Herzog and Kevin Kay, who was our cue card guy. No kidding. Uh -huh. And Lee Kernis, who's a manager, who's a good friend of mine. And we had dinner and we were just telling stories like this, you know, about Wendell. Oh. And Kevin and I we used to be in the pit where the camera was. Camera two would be back in this little carved out area of the audience. This is Studio 6A. Yep. And the pit would, you know, you had a big camera and a big cameraman. You had Wendell, me, Kevin with the cue cards, and usually the segment producer who had the segment that we were we were shooting. Yeah. And it was very tight quarters. It was, you were right on top of people. And all of a sudden you'd hear, and you'd go, Bill, and it would stink. And you were literally two and a half feet away from the audience. And he <laughs> all heard it. The audience heard it all. And we'd crack up. Yeah. We'd laugh. Kevin K, who has like this cackle, like a girl's laugh. And it was like, ah! and we would just crack up. And Letterman would always look around the camera to the side and go, everything OK there? We are, yeah. <laughs> no no. And he go, you sure everything's OK back there? <laughs> and it became a running joke. And we told Letterman what was going on. And it disgusted yep. him. <laughs> How do you do that in front of the audience? God, what are we going to do about this guy? So another chit on Wendell's record. You know, it was, he was a, he was a well-meaning guy. He yeah. loved the show. He was, he, he always wanted to do more and we never let him. Yeah. He, he, he didn't have the comedic ability that Alan Calder ended up. Having. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah. They're totally two different, complete different animals. Yeah. By the way, Don Giller put a compilation together of, of that. Like when that story came out, I don't know if you know this or not, but when that story came out, I think it came out on Malkoff's podcast, actually. Um, Giller went and put a, 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 a little compilation together because of the moments of Dave looking over at you guys, is everything okay? Like, fantastic. I just absolutely love how that story continues on. And it's oh, it's adorable. <laughs> it was something else. I, I, I mean, you know, to this day, I regret the fact that, that we fired him and, yeah. you know, it hurt him. And it hurt his, his family, I think. And, you know, I don't think he worked very much after that. And then he retired and passed away. And, you know, I still bear that. And it's it makes me sad. But, yeah. you know, you but it's a funny, it, it, you can't it's take a funny away story. from the show. It's um, that easy. You know, something, the show is on the stage, not in the well there where, where Bill was doing his <laughs> shit. Yeah. Literally doing his shit. Uh, I definitely want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the the transition over and all that. That's why I asked if it was Late Show or, or, or The Late Show. I mean, yeah, Late Show was um, how I, I always I grew up in it. New York. I grew up in New York and there was... On, on WCBS in New York at yeah. 11.30, they had something called The Late Show, which was a movie. Yes. And then they had, after The Late Show, after the 90-minute movie, they would have, at one in the morning, The Late Late Show. Yep. So when we were coming up with names for the show, I said, why don't we just call it The Late Show? Because that's what it always was on Channel 2. Yeah. And then when we did The Late Late Show, I... I I recall that I suggested there are always versions of stories that people claim credit for this or that. Sure. Absolutely. Endless, the name of the show. And yeah. I recall saying, let's call it the late, late show based on what it used to be called in that time slot for 40 years beforehand. Yeah. So that's how those names came up and Letterman didn't like the late show. He just wanted it the same way. It was late night, not the yeah. late night. So they called it late show. Flip one word. And, and again, when you guys came over from NBC, all of the, like, like, this is the part I want to transfer the knowledge of. There was no bigger story. When this was unfolding, there was no bigger story in show business. You were a part of something. And, and uh, Zinneman actually had a, uh, I asked him about the cult uh, following that, that you guys had versus, you know, some of the other shows that are out there that just simply don't have that following. And, and he's part of it. And this is hits me right in the, right in the uh, forehead is that the people who were in their formative years, it's kind of like with Saturday Night Live, you know, the who's your cast? Well, whoever the cast was in high school is kind of usually people's cast. With the folks who were in, in in high school or college, when the shift happened, 
it's seared into them in a different way than it did other people. And that's probably part of the reason why you guys are so culty. I, I love that. Uh, I think that people thought it would be the end. Right. I think, you know, and, and look, and, and, and history's proven that, that David Letterman knows how to reinvent himself very well. Yes. And to this day. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, to this day, exactly. And he knew, he knew that balance. Yeah. He knew that balance. And I, I'll never forget when we designed the set at the Ed Sullivan Theater. You know, he was he was concerned because he was the greatest studio performer ever. Uh-huh. A studio floor where it's and the audience is above. Yep. You know, you look right at that audience. You don't have to look down on them. He yep. was never a big proscenium performer. Yep. He was never a big stage performer. And here we are on a stage looking down. Yep. He didn't have the studio across the hall. He didn't have, you know. So I think he was kind of concerned. We were all concerned about what the show would would morph into. Yeah. And look, Hal, to Hal's credit, Hal had the foresight to say, this is going to be great doing it from a theater. It's going to change everything. Yeah. We all didn't want to do it from a theater. And... Did you want to go to Burbank? No, none of okay. us want to go to California. So you want to stay in New York, but you couldn't do it at Black Rock. You couldn't do it like, you know. Do it at the broadcast center, but it's on 10th Avenue. There was no presence, you know. There's no magic there, to it like there is 30 Rock, 30 right? Rock. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we, we when they brought up the theater, we went and we said, yeah, let's try it, you know. And let him move smart enough to use the outside and to use Broadway and to use Mirage, uh, Sergio and Mujibar and yep. and and, and, and our know, boy Rupert, of course. Yeah. Mo Deli. Yep. I I have to admit, I I've never eaten a single thing from the Hello Deli. So you're the one. I loved Rupert. Loved. <laughs> Used to always go in and say hello and maybe get a water or something. Never <laughs> ate their food because I had seen the rats. I was a page at the Ed Sullivan Theater. I, okay. <laughs> There it is right there. You were a page at the Ed Sullivan Theater back in the day. I was a page at the Ed Sullivan Theater in the 70s. And I remember seeing the rats in the theater. And it just, it was, they were like cats. They were that big. <laughs> and I thought, I can't eat at a restaurant in that building. Isn't that funny? The food is coming, you know, not that they have rats. I'm not saying. No, it. no, of course not. But no, you know, no. You're, you're, my you're grandfather owned the my grandfather owned coffee shops all throughout New York and had one on Third Avenue and 51st Street. Yep. And they had plenty of rats in that, that restaurant. So I remembered that. And I just never eat at restaurants where, you know, I don't know. But isn't Rupert a, isn't Rupert a prince? Like uh, the kind he's like he's like God took the word kind and made it into a human. He is so kind and so sweet. Uh, the man. love that he's given us and in, in our show, like he's our they're our only sponsor. The Hello Deli is our only sponsor of the show. And 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 he's he and May have just recently announced that they're gonna they're mm -hmm. gonna put a shingle out there and put it up for sale. Uh, Paul came it's on the show and said he and I should buy it. Um, but that's it's history and this history that 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 you helped create. Um, I want to talk to you about that. Uh, okay, so I talked to Carter about this, and I think I hung with him pretty well, which I'm, I'm grateful for. I love Bill Carter. By the way, he did give you the props that the book of, of The Late Shift was your idea. Awesome. I want to talk about that. Who was a publicist. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, the fact I, that, I, that I, it's, it's Carter was great, you know, and Carter. Yeah. I'll never forget the first time I met Carter. He had just started with the New York Times and we were competing with Arsenio Hall. And it was a Monday night. And in the Sunday Times, Arsenio took out a full, it was when he first started. Yep. He took out a full page ad in the Sunday Times in the arts and leisure section. Yep. And in that same section, Bill Carter wrote a very favorable review. All right. The next night, I'm at a party at the Russian Tea Room for Billy Crystal had done a special called uh, The Midnight Train to Moscow, where he, he, he went to see his relatives in Russia. Yeah. And so they had the premiere at the Russian Tea Room. And somebody introduces me to Carter. And I was a little drunk on vodka. 
and I just <laughs> lace into them. I lay, I go, what kind of fucking paper do you call that New York Times? No so kidding. You have a review, a favorable review for Arsenio Hall, and it's a full page ad. <laughs> what kind of fucking rag are you running there? Blah, blah, blah. And I just berate Carter. I scr oh. I'm screaming at him. Ask him about it. And I'm screaming at him. I get home that night and I realize what I've done. So the next day I call Carter and I go, Bill, I had a few too many drinks. <laughs> Obviously, I love the New York Times. You're, you seem like a lovely guy. I hope we have a long and fruitful relationship. He goes, I found it very entertaining. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and we became friends after that. Just before you get going uh, and continuing on that, there's, there's ah! the guy right there. There he is. Look at that guy. Yep. That Look guy. at that guy. Amazing, There's a page at the Ed Sullivan Theater right there, if I've ever seen one. And I always said, I said, I would always say to my mother years later, I'd say, Mom, thank you for never criticizing me or making me cut my hair. <laughs> it. God bless her. She's 93 years old, 92 years old. Um, so here's the thing. I know at the time you guys didn't know it because of Dave's reverence for The Tonight Show. Um, you didn't have that same reverence for the Tonight Show that he had, right? Oh no, we did. We, uh, yeah, you know, it, being a comic, I think it's a it's it's a different set of rules. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 the epitome. It's 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 Nirvana. You get on that show, and at the time, it made your career. Absolutely. You know, I I I I I loved Johnny Carson. Yeah. And obviously, you you love the guy and his talent and. As the years went on, I got to know him and I liked him very much. And I think he liked me very much. He used to have me on the, whenever I'd go, he never let people on the floor. As Letterman never liked people on the floor. Right. He would always let me be on the floor and I'll never forget. He would look around the same way Letterman would look around the camera. Carson would look at me and I, I, I and I told the comedian, Jeff Cesario was a comedian. Yeah. Cesario was on the Tonight Show and I was in the audience. I was on the floor that night. And Carson looked at me and like, it's good. And, you know, Carson like say, he's good. And I told Jeff that and he was like, really? Wow, I can't believe that. You know, but that's the kind of relationship I had with Carson. Yeah. Which was nice. I like him. You, you uh, but, I, but, but no, we, you know, yeah. At I a guess. certain point though, you guys stopped drinking the Tonight Show Kool-Aid when NBC was kind of screwing you with your pants on. You well, guys when, stopped. The, you, know you know when we stopped, you know, when we, we stopped drinking the Kool-Aid, yeah. when he started to mimic what we did and, and he didn't do it well and he realized it. Yeah. And it was kind of a desperate attempt and yep. you, I, I kind of felt badly for him. I didn't turn off on him. No. You know, I still respected the hell out of him, but, but it was like, that's not what you do. And he was smart enough to realize that too. So. This is a great aside. I'm going to ask you this right now because I because I thought maybe you or Merrill might have been in on it. There was one time though where he did it really well, and he did it really well with Dave. The the, the time when he stole Dave's truck, and then they went and did the Wapner thing afterwards. They actually got two or three Tonight Show appearances out of it. Um, Dave didn't know he was stealing the truck, right? Again, we're. Oh, we're... I think Merrill engineered it all. I think okay, Merrill, Merrill engineered it all. Thank you. That's I think Merrill I was, was, I think Merrill was uh, uh, privy to to all that, and they went through her. And okay, because that I'm was pretty, a mashup. I, I mean, I'm not I'm not saying that's for sure, but I, no. I, I had always thought that was the situation. That was kind of what I thought too. But but again, here's an example of Carson actually doing a little bit of Dave's uh shtick if you want to call it that or, or or taking some of that stuff where it actually did work but that's because dave's right there so okay i'm glad you mentioned that um now that being said you guys at a certain point realize this is the point of no return uh you know ovitz shows up um you know and 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 and, and starts that must have been a fun time by the way being wined and dined and absolutely 100 percent uh, uh, catered to by mike ovitz it? that must have been fun what was fun about it was and Michael Ovitz made it fun. Yeah. Because Mark, he had this reputation of being the killer. He was Mike Ovitz, for God's sakes. L'chaim. Yep. Are you a Jew? Mm -mm. Yeah. L'chaim anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, Ovitz made it fun because he was the revered. He was, uh, you know, the Wizard of Oz. He was the guy behind the curtain. He was, you know... Michael Ovitz, oh my God, in hushed tones, we're going to meet Michael Ovitz. <laughs> and we just abused him. We just used to abuse the shit out of him. 
and he loved it. They would Let make fun of him. I obviously I didn't do it. It was all stemming from Letterman giving us license to do it, yep. and then we all followed suit. We'd make fun of him. You know, he would. We'd have a <laughs> meeting with him, and we'd mention that the so and so is not treating us too well. They're not giving us a lot of guests, and he would pull out. He had a single buck slip in a leather like little binder that the corners went into the thing and he'd pull out this piece of leather and he'd write a note and put it back in his pocket and letterman would go who are you going to kill you're going to kill somebody is that a fucking hit list are you going to murder some you're going to have somebody killed right and the Ovitz would just laugh and you know giggle about it and we just used to do crazy shit with him and I stayed very good friends with Ovitz. And, and when Ovitz left CAA, yeah. Letterman was very upset because as Letterman used to say about Ovitz, he goes, he's not the smartest guy in the world necessarily. He's this much smarter than every agent he's ever had. This right. much smarter. And it was true. There were agents all over the place. It wasn't like this was Ovitz over here. He was yeah. this much smarter. Which is not to say that he wasn't a bright guy. He was a very bright guy and very yep. cultured and yep. a lovely guy. He loved us. He just loved hanging out with us. He loved fooling around with us and ordering pizzas. And he, <laughs> it was the one opportunity I think he got to be a real guy. Yeah. And he just used to love coming to the show. And I'll never forget. So anyway, when he left CAA and went to Disney... Letterman was very upset. He felt like he left, he lost, you know, his most trusted advisor and guy that got him where he, where he got. Yeah. And Ovitz and I hatched a plan. And the plan was, what if Disney buys Worldwide Pants? And if Disney buys Worldwide Pants Whoa. and our library and our assets, and our commitments from CBS. Everybody loves Raymond. We hadn't done the pilot yet. If Disney buys all that, one, they pay a fortune for it. Two, yeah. Michael Ovitz and D David Letterman would be partners and he'd be back in business with Ovitz. Holy shit, Morty. I've never heard this. this is, that's amazing. Why didn't at, it happen? At the time, Letterman, and, and, and this is how I surmise it happened. I think there were other factors in my getting fired, but I had always kind of put two and two together where there were people that when Ovitz left, they ascended to be the, the point person for Letterman. Okay. Lee Gabler and Jim Jackway, who was Letterman's attorney and Fred Nigro, his business manager. Okay. And I don't think they wanted Ovitz back in Letterman's life. So when they caught wind of this secret proposal that Ovitz and I wrote, uh, they turned against me. And I think they convinced Letterman to turn against me, that I was out for myself, I was out for the money, whatever it was. <clears throat> but I became very close. So when I got fired, the night that I got fired, I went back into my office and I called Ovitz, who was at Disney. And I said, I can't believe I just got fired. He goes, good. He goes, you'll, you'll come here. You'll be the Lorne Michaels of Disney, of ABC, blah, 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 blah. I'll give you a deal. Simultaneously, he was negotiating with my girlfriend at the time, who was Jamie Tarsus, and she became the president of entertainment at ABC. So he couldn't give me a deal because it looked like she was giving me the deal, which she wasn't. Ovitz gave me a deal there. So I had to wait like a year before I got a deal. But Ovitz had promised me and took very good care of me. And when Ovitz was at the, uh, on the outs there, I'll, I'll never forget going up to seeing him. Yes. to see him at the Disney headquarters. And he was in this gigantic office. He had not a paper on his desk. And, and he broke down crying. And he said, I don't know what to do here, Morty. What the fuck do I do? He goes, they call this building the Team Disney building. There's no teamwork in this company. I mean, he's sobbing, sobbing. And I go, Michael, you're better than all this. Don't blah, 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 blah. You know, trying to placate him. And he goes, Morty, you're the only one that knows I have a sense of humor. You and Dave know that I'm funny and that I can have fun. I'm not serious. And, and it was a very interesting conversation. And shortly thereafter, he left, you know. 
Well, here's a guy who who used to be the guy who could call all the shots and 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 suddenly is thrown into a, a machine. And uh, you know, sometimes that works out, sometimes that doesn't. This is a flabbergasting uh story to me. Yeah. Um, I'm grateful that you're telling it. And he um, uh to this day I still get a handwritten birthday card from him every year. You know, and he writes something goofy and funny, and you know, he 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 liked being funny with us. Yeah. I don't think he got that opportunity with, with too many people. I really don't. Well, it was a crazy situation. And I mean, you know, he's got the syndicators in front of you and he's got the other networks in front of you and all these sorts of things. And 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 at the end of the day, the CBS deal made so much sense in so many ways. Um, the irony that I talk about as much as I possibly can to anybody who will listen, I don't think there's anybody on the planet who might be more uh, qualified to hear this kind of theory that I've always had. The irony of this is crazy to me. Because nobody had been able to compete with The Tonight Show, period. I I appreciate the fact that the way things were going, like, again, Gretzky talks about don't go where the puck is, go where the puck is going. The way the puck was going was the dilution of things. I get it. But the fact that you guys, in not getting The Tonight Show, were the ones who walked across the street, got the continuation of the Johnny Carson deal. Car took Carson fucking 30 years to get the deal where ownership in the next 1230 slot, which, again, got Tom out and got you guys in. Irony again. But the fact is, you guys got to continue the Carson deal with the promise that you would build them a franchise for the first time ever and you wanted the tonight show so badly but really at the end of the day you guys walk across the street and start ramparting the tonight show and are responsible again the that that quickly. honestly okay, go ahead we okay. walked across the street but cbs didn't have the full complement of stations no, that, they, again, yeah, underhanded with a hand tied behind your back. Absolutely. They did not have a full lineup of the, of CBS affiliates. Yes. And we had to work. We had to go. I remember going with Letterman to Dallas, to Nashville, to Houston, to Las Vegas, to, I mean, Letterman and I and Peter came along to some of them. You know, we used to do these road trips and Letterman would get so pissed off at me. because I was about to say, those must have been happy trips. Oh, they were horrible. <laughs> they were horrible. We were in uh, Houston and, you know, Letterman loves aviation and is always interested in planes and we're taking the tour of the station and they go, you want to go up on a roof and see the weather helicopter? So I said, yeah, let's go. <laughs> Letterman was, fuck you, we don't want to see what, we got to go and see the weather helicopter? What, we've never seen a helicopter before? Jesus, Morty, why did you think? <laughs> And we went to the weather helicopter and you know, they made him sit in the, the, the cockpit, whatever. Uh, one of the most depressing days of my life was we were in Nashville and Letterman and I had dinner together at the seafood. You know, it was like a theme restaurant. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, I don't know, Fisherman's Catch or something like that. And when you walked into the restaurant, there was this gigantic scale. You know, the kind with the big round readout and, yep. you know, and they put the fish on it and you'd see how much the fish weighed. It was, uh, you know. Yeah. The letterman says to me, he goes, get on the scale. I go, I'm not getting on the scale. He goes, Morty, get on the scale. I say, all right. It's the first time in my life that I weighed over 200 pounds. <laughs> I got on that scale and I saw it was like 204 or something. And I was like, I'm going to kill myself. I weigh over 200 pounds. I can't fucking believe it. You know? It was something. And he would, of course, you weigh over 200 pounds, Morty. What are you going to do? <laughs> um, but we had, okay, so we were in Dallas. Like, we yeah. were in Dallas. Yep. Watching, and he missed the flight. He missed the connecting flight in Dallas. I don't know what the fuck he was doing. <laughs> uh, but we were watching when they busted uh, the Branch Davidians. And and David Koresh, it was yeah. happening while we were in Texas. And we're watching, we were transfixed. We were watching the local news coverage when they were going in with the fire bombing and all. Yep. It was just wild. And we were there. Yep. Fun. The uh well the series and it's funny it's like the series is coming out right now. The miniseries of the, the limited series is about to come out on Koresh. Mm -hmm. Um so that being said, okay, and, and we had George Schweitzer on. And he talked about a little bit how, you know, and, and Bill Carter is obviously uh, expertly reported that CBS kind of had one hand tied behind their back. 
you know, but at the same time, you guys go over 18 months, beat them in the ratings, all that. You guys are firing the first shots across the bow and actually creating a franchise that could compete with the tonight show. The irony of ironies is crazy to me. The fact that, that, that you guys had so much reverence for this show and then it becomes okay. Like again, Mr. Leno, I, I, I will appreciate the fact that he, you know, ah, I came in at number one. I left at number one. Okay, fine. But no, nobody had ever competed with the tonight show ever. And you guys gave CBS a franchise. Once Dave was done with it, Colbert's number one. Like, like, and and the dilution happened. I get that, but one the reason fact why there was one reason and one reason only. Yes, sir. Prime time. When when CBS lost its dominance in prime time and started skewing older and football, yeah, and football losing yeah. football, yeah, it, it it hurt us. You're 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 only as good as the lead in you get, right? You know, believe me. We had the late night show and we did well, you know, given the time we thought we were doing horribly, but we were getting, you know, 4 million viewers at the time. And it was like, oh, who gets you were competing against the Tonight Show, which was uncompetable. And they were giving us they were giving us tremendous leadings. Yes. Our rule of thumb was always if we lose half the audience, we're fucked. Yes. We used to check those ratings in the morning. It was the most stressful time of my 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 time there. Yeah. And um the only reason we lost dominance was because we got fucked in prime time and didn't yes. get any lead-ins. Yes. And we started going older and it was Matlock and this one and that one. And, you know, all of a sudden it wasn't the audience that we were craving. And yes. you know, they had musty TV and they did younger shows and they had friends and they had this and they had sure. that, you know, something that's how we lost. It wasn't about the quality of our show and his show. It just no. so happened that it coincided with Hugh Grant's appearance on the show, on the Tonight Show. Yeah. And that happened because uh, Hugh's publicist, you know, he was a desirable guest, whether he was caught with hookers or not, he was a, a pretty big guest. So Definitely. they would be out of fairness and the publicists would, you know, they were very fair. They would alternate. One movie, Letterman would get him first. One movie, Leno would get him first. Mm-hmm. So that movie, just by luck of the draw, Letterman, uh, Leno got you Grant first and got him the night that after he was caught. So, you know, that that was the the spark plug that brought on the defeat. But you, know, uh, but you call it a defeat. It wasn't because people watched it and liked Leno. It was because people happened to have watched it and it was about the time when the season was changing. And yes, you know. So. That being anyway, said, I away from Jay, Jay's a, a good host, you know, fantastic comedian. Yes. Um, my point is, five years before before any of that stuff happened, if the numbers were the same, if you would have offered any of the other networks other than NBC, uh, blind, doesn't matter who's hosting it, you're going to get this many numbers against The Tonight Show. You're going to be second, but you're going to get this many numbers against The Tonight Show. Do you want that? Every single one of those networks would have said yes, because nobody had ever competed with The Tonight Show. That's my point. And the the, the fact that you know, number one is number one, but the fact that something could not just sustain, but actually permeate the American or the, the international culture while the Tonight Show was still in existence had was unprecedented. That's never happened. And that's one of the, you guys, you know, cast the first stone towards that. And and there's something to be said for that. I don't think you get enough credit for that. Um, they were dominant and they were no longer dominant, <laughs> you know, and that to me uh, is a testament to the work and the quality that you guys all guys and gals, I should say all did during that time. It was the most exciting time in television and you were helming the ship. Um, Congratulations on that. I'm saying it all these years later, it was fucking awesome. And it still is to me. I still love getting, get fired up talking about it. I love it. It was was a fun time in my life. It really was. Um, But you know, it's funny. Um, you talk about George Schweitzer, who I yes, knew sir. when I was a page. He was a production manager when I was a page. So I, I go way back with George. What a phenomenal marketing mind. Oh, great. Great. Yeah. But, but you know the problem? When we got there, you know, promo writers are all frustrated writers. They want to be comedy writers. They all want to be working on, on the Letterman show. They don't want to be writing promos for it. So as a result... When we first got there, they started trying to write funny promos, but they were never in our voice. They were never in our sensibility. 
they were always off and we would always reject, reject, just do a straight promo. Yeah. But Dave provide the, the, the joke and you just go coming soon on CBS, 1135, you know, whatever. And they never got it. They just couldn't resist the temptation. <laughs> so we were getting frustrated with the, the fact that they always wanted to do funny promos and they kept trying, they kept trying. So we had the idea of hiring our own promo people and doing our own promos. So that pissed off George and it pissed off CBS because they had only allowed it once before when Cosby did his show, his new show at CBS, that, yeah. let him have control of the promos and they brought in an outside agency. So we started interviewing outside people. And I'll never forget J.J. Abrams, who wasn't J.J. Abrams. No. Nope. He came in with the guy from Grounded for Life, the cab driver on MTV, the redheaded guy. Uh, okay. I don't have it, but Don will get it to us in a second. Donald Lug. Okay, yeah. So okay, he, came yeah. In with, he came in with Donald Lug, and they pit, who's a great, great comic, and they pitched an idea for a promo campaign that was great. And we had to pitch it up to CBS and they, yeah, wow, that's no good. And, you know, we had a, never ended up hiring an outside agency and CBS resented me. They didn't like me because I, I was the cowboy who wanted to do our own promos. Funny. Very funny. You, you know, um, years later. No, I loved about that though, was that you made I, fun of like, this one quick story. Please, please I do. Yeah. Fired. I get fired from, from the Letterman show. Yeah. And, Part of my exit deal was that they were going to give me an office for a year at BlackRock, the CBS headquarters. And I was on like the 32nd floor. Yeah. And they used to call it the bad boys floor because anybody that got fired and had an exit deal, they would give an office on that floor. So Eric Ober, who was fired as the president of CBS News, he was on that floor. I no was kidding. on that floor. And it was the bad boys floor. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, they gave me an assistant. They paid for my assistant. They gave me a beautiful office overlooking Sixth Avenue, big view. Wow. wow. For a year. Uh, you know, I didn't have much to do. I was kind of, you know, looking to figure out what I was going to do for a career. And um, so I used to have lunch every day at, at the China Grill, which was in the lobby of the CBS building. Yep. So one day I'm having lunch there and I see Cosby and Moonves together having lunch. And I, I, you know, I would be there with magazines, reading and eating alone. And I had to pass them to get out of the restaurant. So of course I pass them and say hello. And Cosby goes in front of Moonves, he says this, he goes, I can't believe you got fired from that show. He goes, you were the heart and soul of that program. He goes, you were the Papa Bear. You were the conscience of that show. He goes, I will never do that show again now that you're gone. Uh -huh. And I was like, Bill, that's so sweet of you. Thank you. And in front of Moonves, and, you know, Moonves is, oh, wow, you know, Moonves is even sure. impressed. So. In the moment, yeah. <laughs> I'm like flying high thinking, what a great thing. That night I get home, watch the Letterman show, put it on. Tonight, Bill Cosby. Yeah. <laughs> He was on that night. He taped it at 5.30 right after lunch. He <laughs> promised he's never going to do this show again. <laughs> so I knew Bill Cosby was a liar from that day on. Well, then he went on to guest host it when Dave was off, too. Um, I was gone by then. Yeah, no, you were gone by then. But, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and I want to quickly talk about this right now. And maybe we have time to go through the pictures. Maybe we don't. I don't know. But, but um you know, the famous, uh, I, the picture, I had never seen the, I don't think I'd seen the picture before, um, you know, in, in, in 2015, when in the coinciding with the release of this episode, where we're doing 20th, that 15th and May 20th, my 70th birthday. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And so we're going to release this the day before, uh, on the Friday. Um, you odd, you had this reconciliation with Dave and it was captured. It was captured, uh, you know, you beautiful pictures of it. It was um, like, you know, when, when you know, Trump met with the, the guy from Korea, all the shots going, you know, 
people yeah. were taking pictures of the two of us and he pulled me aside and he whispered in my ear and he said some very nice things and yeah. you know it kind of was full circle for me you know it was i realized that he had respect for me and you know he was in a situation where he fired me and you know what, what am i gonna do yeah funny story the night i got fired um mandy patinkin was a guest on the show <laughs> and mandy i i so I, I was friendly with Mandy. So he calls me up that afternoon. And he goes, Morty, I have an idea. He said, I want to do some magic tricks for Dave. He goes, you know, I have four or five. He goes, I don't have anything to talk about. He goes, I really want to do these magic tricks for him. I've really done them well. And, and I think he'll enjoy it. So I said, all right, let me talk to him about it. I go to Letterman. And I'm sure in his mind, he knew he had to fire me that night. It was the night I got fired. So... Letterman says, um, Letterman said, I say to Letterman, I said, Mandy wants to do magic tricks. What do you think of that? He goes, no. He goes, what am I, well, he goes, what am I supposed to do? Act surprised when he does a magic trick? I have to fake being surprised. That's why he hated getting gifts on the show. Right. He never liked to be surprised with a gift because he'd have to feign appreciation. He had a feign that he likes it, whatever yeah. it is. So he goes, I know all these tricks. He goes, what am I going to do? Like, oh, wow, I'm amazed. He goes, I don't want to have to act and 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 react that way. So I go to Mandy and Mandy goes, well, I have nothing else, Morty. I have to do these tricks. So finally, I convinced Letterman. I said, let him do the fucking tricks. What's the big deal, right? I'm getting yeah. a drop. Hold on. So one of the tricks he wants to do is where he goes behind Letterman's head, right? And now Letterman had a thing with his neck. Letterman claimed that he had a broken neck. Yes, Claimed that, you know, he was in a car accident, whatever it was, yep. and that he broke his neck. So Mandy had this trick where he would get behind Letterman and he'd go. Oh, boy. And, and it, it wasn't supposed to squeak. It's a dog toy with a water <laughs> bottle. So he had a water bottle under his arm and he'd go. No, not supposed to yep. squeak. No, I hear it. No, we hear it. The water bottle. Yep. So it sounded like cracking his neck. Yep. So everybody like goes, oh, he touched Letterman's neck. Oh, my God. And Letterman looks at me, you know, gives me the around the camera look. And I knew he was pissed. So after the show, he calls me into his office and he fires me. Now, I, of course, think it's because I let him touch. I said, Dave, he goes, it's not about that. He goes, we want to make a change, blah, 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 blah. You know, so that was... Uh, so anyway, I go back to Poor my Mandy. <laughs> so I go back to my office and the phone rings and it's Mandy and I had just gotten fired. And he goes, Morty, is, is Dave pissed off? I'm so sorry, blah, blah, blah. I go, Mandy, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I gotta go. I'll call. Yeah. <laughs> so I rushed him off the phone, didn't tell him I got fired. And years later, he, he he says to me, he goes, You got fired that night. He goes, Did I have anything? I go, No, Mandy, you didn't, blah, blah, blah. So it was funny. Just a real quick aside to your audience, uh, the Gen X audience. Okay, so at that point in my life, Canadian kid, the only reason I knew um, Manny Patinkin at all uh, was because of Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride, and he was my fucking hero. Everyone loved, my age, loved Inigo Montoya. So when we would watch Letterman, and I remember watching with high school buddies, and Inigo Montoya would suddenly show up and burst into song for no reason or whatever. We were like- Tommy what? Randall. We loved it. Letterman was a, a big fan. He used to watch the old Jack Benny shows. Yeah. And Jack Benny used to have a running gag. He had a singer named Dennis Day. And he had a, his his announcer was uh, Don, I forget his last name. Jesus Christ. Don, heavy set guy. I forget his name. Okay, they I would think do Giller bit, will probably speed it to us in a second. They would do a bit where, where Don would burst into the studio and say to Jack, Jack, we just had a flat tire and uh, Dennis has to rehearse his song. Can we rehearse it here? So Letterman heard that on the Jack Benny show and we directly lifted it and it would be Tony Randall knocking on the door, coming yep. in and hey, I just had a, a flat tire and Mandy has a gig and we got to rehearse the song. He goes, can we rehearse it here? And Letterman goes, well, I guess, you know, just like Jack Benny, well. And Paul would have the charts and Paul would play. And it would always, we took such great care. I remember Letterman saying, we got to get a song 
And and he used this term that will blow the fucking roof off the place. Yes. He goes, it has to be a song that is just so powerful that it blows the roof off the place. Yep. And so Paul would always build to it. And then Mandy would belt out this fucking song that would yep. stop the show. It would just, people would jump to their feet. Just yep. crazy. They'd jump to their feet. And then it would be, okay, bye. Thanks, Dave. And they'd run out and Dave would be like, well, you know, like, look at him. He just stole the show from me. Yep. He just did the high point of the show. How could I follow that? And that's how good Letterman was, that he he, he knew to play that moment, you know, and he knew that he could recover. It was great. Don Wilson, by the way, was the announcer. Don Wilson, yes. Thank you, uh, Don. Thanks, thanks Giller. Appreciate that. Um I very much want, and don't get me wrong, I'm not rapping. I, I just want to be very conscious of your time. Can, uh, and 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 also, we're recording right now. Can maybe we do the pictures uh, next time you come on? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I just sent it to you. Okay. Yeah. okay, I appreciate that. Um, I, I got a next time from Schaefer. I got a next time from Morty. I'm a happy guy tonight. I want to do uh, some word association with you, if that's okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I've got 10 or 11 of them here. Some of them you've already talked about. I might skip a couple of them. Just a couple of words about what I'm about to say for the, for some of these people. What do you want? Um, you like a one word answer? Uh, one word, a sentence, two sentences, whatever you want. If it goes into a story, it goes into a story. I'm not, I'm loose. Uh, number one, Meryl Marco. Genius. Yeah. Genius. The, the heart and soul of the operation. The, yeah. the creator of the show, the creator of the sensibility <laughs> the the beacon behind the comedy, the beacon behind the writers that we hired, the the tenor of everything. Yeah, she was uh, a she is a brilliant person, and still is. The stuff she's putting out on her Substack is fantastic. What is it? I don't. I don't yeah, up. no, she's she's got a lot of good stuff coming out. By the way, there's the moment right there. There's D Day right there. Oh right. my God, look at that! Wow, well, it's uh, funny. The th if it's okay with you, by the way, the thumbnail for this show is going to be you and Dave hugging and reuniting. If that's all right with you, um, I appreciate that picture very, very much. But there's the there's that day in question. Uh, yeah, we're going to try and get Meryl on the show because I mean, absolutely genius. I view her the same way. Uh, Steve O'Donnell. Steve O'Donnell was another genius. Yeah. Steve O'Donnell was, you know, another guy that carried the torch, carried the sensibility. Steve is a lovely guy and a great writer and was a great head writer. There was always an argument that he created the top 10 list and Adam Resnick was, was the judge who heard me create the top 10 list. <laughs> I didn't actually create it. I had the idea. I was, we were standing in the reception area at the old show and I had just gotten a copy of People Magazine who did the 10 most beautiful people in the world. Yep. I said, you know something, we should do our ten, our own 10 best list. At which point Steve O'Donnell says, yeah, that's a great idea. I'll, I'll, I'll write some up. And he crafted it as the top 10 list, even though it was my suggestion that we do our own list. So Adam Resnick used to get pissed off when Steve O'Donnell would take credit for creating it. He goes, you took credit. You did it. Why don't you <laughs> tell Steve? I go, what do I care? You know, it's a big thing. Things that almost sound Steve like was, Steve was great. Steve was great. Steve <laughs> yeah. had a, a a monster of a job. It yeah. was, you know, being the head writer on that show, you know, you're administering a, a staff of 12, 15 people. You're yeah. dealing with a piece of talent who's very choosy, who likes one out of every 50 jokes. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, the deadline would always come and, and, and Steve would be, you know, it would be, 4.30 and we'd be going down to the studio at five and we'd have to load the Chiron and do whatever we had to do. Yep. And Steve didn't have a, an act one and it, God bless him. He'd always come up with an idea. Letterman would say, no, that's horrible. You know, I remember once the one that, that I, I remember so well was Steve said, let's go take a camera on the street and we'll find a baby and we'll bring the baby up. And Letterman goes, yeah. And then what am I supposed to do? What do I do with the baby? Do I diaper the baby? And I would, and, and, we would do it and it would be funny. Letterman would be great. You know, it was just, yep. we're Steve. I, I, I adore Steve. Me too. Um, my boy, Dan Kellison. Daniel Kellison, I always describe, and he gets pissed at me. I always describe, I would always describe Daniel Kellison as a little puppy dog. Oh. Um, he would come and like a puppy, he'd rub his head on your leg and you'd push him away. Hmm. And you'd rub his head again on your leg and you'd push him away. And the third time, he'd rub his head on your leg. You'd pick him up. 
I need pee on you. <laughs> Daniel was always the guy that would bug me. Let's let so-and-so come in on a horse. Let's fly Sean Connery in on a jetpack. <laughs> and then it would fuck, something would get fucked up. And I go, Daniel, why do you have this? Why don't you have that? Daniel was was the most creative segment producer we ever had. And I was a segment producer, so that's high praise. Um, <laughs> Daniel always had great ideas. It was always a, 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 a process getting getting there. But Daniel's a, a creative, talented, fun guy. And I'm still friends with him. And he'll get pissed at me for using the little puppy dog, but he's heard me describe it about 50 times. So he's uh he's been on I've the show. With, and I've worked with Daniel since. Daniel and yeah. I did, Daniel and I did the Sports Illustrated Sports Person of the Year awards together. We did, I think, three or four of them. Yeah. You know, so he was always very good to me, Daniel. Um, yeah, I just appreciate him so much. He, 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 he told a version of the Madonna story on this show. That was just fantastic. Um, I just, yeah, I just, I let him blame me for Madonna. Let him, let him got pissed at me because he had heard and, and his assistant probably told him she used to squeal on everybody, but it wasn't true that I told Madonna, just get out there and say dirty things and do whatever you want. And I think Kellison maybe did it. But Letterman thought I did it and was pissed at me for months. Months didn't talk to me because he was mad at me that that I had I put Madonna up to it. Once okay. again, irony because that was a legendary segment. And to the Gen X audience, we absolutely worshipped that segment and ate it up. And the PS to that story, by the way, um, Charles Groden the next night. Oh my God, Charles Groden the next night brings him. Uh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. Has a pair of boxer shorts and hands it over to Dave. They're clean. I, is this what we do now? And and the PS to that was uh, unbelievable. And it's good to mention Charles Groden right now. Uh, Pete Fadovich. Pete Fadovich, uh, the funniest guy you'll ever meet. Just not even trying, not even trying. He was he was an original. He brought fun to the show. We we loved seeing him. He would get annoying at times, but you know, but always a, a joy to be be with. And you know, he had some tragedy in his life at the end, but but was a good man. And Hal took very good care of him and. You know, he would direct and Pete was a, Pete was a, a good guy. Uh, Chris Elliott. Chris Elliott was a natural, you know, started as an intern and pushed his way on the air and always delivered, always delivered, never let us down. And, and ultimately I, it, it, his pieces on the show were probably the, biggest laughs I'd have on that show. Mm -hmm. I would just laugh my ass off at every piece he did. I just found them endlessly entertaining. Uh, a, a, a genius. I mean, a, 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 a true genius in his own way. And yeah, unfortunately, it was the best he ever was. And that partnership between and that trust between he and Dave, uh, you know, he hasn't recaptured it, and it's it's a shame because he's so fucking talented. He's so good. So well, good. I I love how he you know the the narrative is that he could actually stand up. He would stand up to Dave and 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 throw the comedy back in the face of uh, when some people have a hard time saying truth to power. Or in this case, comedy to power. Um, he had no problem doing that. Great and, confidence. You gotta great, love that. Great confidence, and yeah, yeah just the funniest shit. You know, the more downy stuff, the 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 Brando <laughs> shit, the guy under the seats. I mean, classic, classic pieces. Yeah. And he and Adam Resnick, who, you know, is is one of the geniuses as far as I'm concerned. And when we started Worldwide Pants, Adam and I produced a show called The High Life. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember it. It was a great show on HBO. We sold it to HBO. And Adam had the vision. He wanted to do it in black and white. And HBO let us, Chris Albrecht, God bless him, let us do it in black and white. I got fired after the pilot. And I think they did 10 episodes and it didn't do anything, but it was a genius show. If you ever get a chance to see it, it's great. Absolutely. I think it's on the archives. I think it's on the HBO archives still. Oh, um, is it still? Oh, good. Well, it is up here in Canada anyway. I, I, um, that's how I've seen it. Um, I'll tell you the most depressing thing I saw yesterday. Tell me. I was telling uh, Doug Herzog this and they were cracking up. I saw an ad for Shark Week, and it's going to be on Max. 
Oh no. <laughs> That's what HBO is becoming. Shark Week. Oh. So depressing. There's something to be said for a boutique network that brought you Larry Sanders and shows like that. Um, uh, let's see here. Okay, so we've talked about this person. We've talked about this person. We've talked about this person. Um, oh, let's do uh, Madeline Smith Perk. Madeline is is a force of of nature. Madeline yes, is Madeline's the most enthusiastic, funny, who had a talent that I don't know where the fuck she got it. <laughs> she had a talent of finding the most obscure, but 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 where Madeline, you know, there are a lot of people that can find them. But Madeline was great at vetting them and knowing how to milk it for comedy. Yeah. Madeline was a very funny, very smart woman. Uh, you know, and she she not only, you know, there are a lot of people that could find interesting, creative, you know, nuts. Mm -hmm. But if, if you don't create the the dialogue and you don't know how to produce it to to get the jokes, you know, that's where Madeline was brilliant. You know, she knew how and and the combination of what she fed Letterman and what Letterman did on his own, you know, was 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 genius. Yeah. And and Madeline is is terrific. I adore Madeline. And we'll do a shout out to her right now. Glad that she's uh, feeling the way that she is right now, because things look really, really good. And I appreciate that. I appreciate her very much. Italy. She's in Italy for a couple of months. Yeah, and... she just got back. She just got back with a nice guy and she just son is grown up and he's a good kid and yeah we're gonna out. tell we're gonna tell that love story on the letterman podcast at some point she and i are just trying to uh it's an amazing love story um yeah fuck it you know what let's finish off with uh, and then oh, I'm gonna come on, on give me more names i'm enjoying oh this. no 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 okay well well okay so the one that's to me that's close to my heart because this show wouldn't exist without him uh is is shecky rick sheckman <laughs> shecky was an enigma. I mean, he <laughs> in death, Shecky has proved everybody wrong. I, I think everybody looked at Shecky as a guy who had no life. He lived with his mother. Then when his mother passed away, he lived in that house. It was him and his films. He would work, you know, long days. And Finding stock footage for the show was maybe 2% of what he did. Yep. Shecky was just everybody's pal. And Shecky had a photographic mind for that show and knew every bit, every detail. And he was like my, my sidekick. Shecky, uh, you know, I used to have to pick uh, a woman named Sue Hall, used to find the stupid Petrix. And you know, she'd show us videotape and we'd decide what Petrix we'd have on. And then before the show, we'd rehearse them and it would be Sue and me. And for some reason, Shecky became a part of that operation. Wasn't had nothing to do with what his job was, but I always felt comfortable having Shecky by my side yeah. looking at stupid Petrix. So Shecky would say, no. And I go, really, Shecky? That's a good one. He goes, nope, nope, nope. And he was always right on with which one we'd lead when, with which one we'd end with. And Shecky was invaluable. But but what, what I found surprising in death with Shecky is how broad his network is, how, yeah. how many true friends and dear friends he had. We always imagined him to be this lonely guy who went home at night and looked at movies. But he had such an active social life and had such a, an active, you know, curiosity of, of, of film and, and, and the arts and, and, you know, so many deep friendships with people that mattered and had such intelligent conversations and, and, you know, Leonard Maltin writing a piece about him, Alex, you know, it, 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 it really opened up a whole new appreciation for what, what Rick was about. Yeah. You know, he he'll be missed. Uh, very, very much so. Uh, I've said it before. This show wouldn't exist if it wasn't for for Rick. Um, Rick vetted me. Um, and, and, and one thing that I just appreciate so much about him um, was he would talk to me for the last three years. He and I talked a lot. Yeah. And uh, uh, um, he was so proud of people that he hired that did well. He wanted people to succeed. If Rick took a shine to somebody for whatever it was, whether it was a new intern or whether it was somebody, or, or, or he helped Scott Ryan write that book, The Last Days of Letterman. He actually kind of really helped get that going. He loved to be 
a service to somebody excelling. And there's a lot of people in the pants family, by the way, who have that same thing, but he just did that to me and for me. And he would constantly talk about with pride people that like you talk about Mary. He's like, I hi helped hire Mary and look at Mary now. Like he's so fucking proud of her and, and, and not just her, but many, many people. And, and um, he and I bonded because we have same similar interests in different generations. So he would, uh, you know, I had a wrestling promotion as part of my, my financial career. The way that we gave back to the community was we didn't do a golf tournament. We put on a wrestling show. And so when Shecky found that out, he started telling me about how he used to go down to the garden and watch Bruno San Martino every week. And, and, and he would, every month he would go down and he had the programs from it still. And we just bonded over that. We bonded over comic books. And he had, like you said, you put it perfectly, Morty. He had so many, uh, Don called them uh, orbits. He had so many orbits and people who just cared about him and he cared for them in these different worlds. And, and uh, so I'm glad you mentioned that. That's, that's, I that's love really seeing, I love the recognition that he got in me that. Too. It me was, too. So for me, it was so oddly enough, enjoyable to see, <laughs> you know, it, it, it made me proud of him. Uh, you know, speaking of so successors, awesome. he would, you know, his travel pictures where he never smiles and it, you know, he was, he was hilarious. He was in Antarctica he, with resting bitch face. Yes, absolutely. It was just a wonder. He would go on vacations with Brian McAloon, who was a director and an associate yeah. director in the beginning. And they'd go on cruises. And I think, what the fuck do these guys do on these cruises? You know, I mean, are they going after women? Are they, I, I, I just never got what he was doing. You know, I always thought he was just this lonely guy. But he was just had this rich life that was so nice to see. Yeah. 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 Um... Uh, Barbara Gaines. Barbara Gaines, you know, with Kathy and with Jude and with, with yeah. Rick, they were the heart and soul of, of the operation. Yeah. You know, Barbara, you know, what I like most, and I don't talk to Barbara much and I adore her. And we used to be good friends. You know, we were the two Jews on the show. So, <laughs> you know, Barbara, I, I, I love how she matured. You know, Barbara was goofy. Barbara was a fucking goofball. She and Jude would sit in that production office smoking like chimneys. It would stink, <laughs> right? And she was like a kid and everybody, ah, Barbara, and she talking a high voice. And then all of a sudden she became, you know, the producer and the executive producer. And, you know, I wasn't there to observe it firsthand, but I I, I always got a kick out of how she stepped up and 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 became this this powerhouse. Well, uh, she's she's a good woman. Don Giller. He's a fucking bum. <laughs> this guy latched on to the shows that I produce, put his own fucking name, Don's TV, whatever the fuck that is, and has co-opted my work. Don's a good guy. Don, everybody relies on Don. I always used to love seeing him outside the theater when he was a nothing. <laughs> he was a little street urchin who used to hang outside the theater. But I adore Don. He's a, he's a he's he, I'm so glad that he's part of the team after all these years. Oh, me too, me yeah. too. And that archive, like again, and without Rick now, uh, especially too, like like there goes the safety. Like the two of them, you keeper know, the archive of, the of this body of work is important. He's right? the keeper of the flame. Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. Which is what I'm what we're trying to do with this show. Anecdotally, um, listen, you have you have blown away any hopes that I have had. And my hopes were pretty fucking high. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. Uh, this is funny of, though. I wish I were funnier. You are funny, man. You, oh no, 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 no. You absolutely. You are. Um, I, I, I'm really grateful that, uh, that you did have that, that moment with the two, the two people coming together with the flashbulbs around. I'm really, really from the bottom of my heart, happy that you had that. Wow. Um, have you, are, has there been talk with pants about doing the, uh, uh, the favorite moments segment because I think yours would be pretty uh, intriguing. Nobody's asked me. Really? I'm here. I'd love to do it. I'm not going to say anything bad. I'm, oh, I only have uh, positive, wonderful memories of being. Let's there. get those wheels going. Hey, Walter. Um, I'll, tell no, let's, I'll, let's... Tell story, I'll tell the story about the first clip I'm going to show is Mandy Patinkin. <laughs> there, oh, there we go. Boom. Done. There it is. Um, Don, do you have any questions for for? Uh, Mr. Morton here before we, before oh, you, I got to show this picture that you just sent Don. Thank you for sending that. Look at that. That was an art opening. That was at, uh, uh, 
uh, Mark Carson. Uh, Mark Carson's art. He he did a show at a local gallery here of the bumpers. Yeah. Then when I heard he was like asking for like seven hundred dollars for the bumper pictures, I said, "Fuck that! I got a copy of my own. That's all I need." <laughs> Get Mark's book, everybody. Good it's book. so good. Good book. Good, good friend of our artist. show, and we want to do some more stuff with Mark here. But I see Mark a lot. I run it. Mark and I live in the same area, so I see him oh, quite often. He's a love good that guy. Yep. So, yep. so, I'm, a, so I'm a schmuck, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, we actually have something in common uh -oh. that would be of interest to nobody. Uh, you mentioned Jamie Tarsus. Yeah. Jamie's dad, Jay, mm -hmm. uh, my mom babysat for him in Baltimore in the 40s. No in shit. The early 50s. Not that funny? Uh, this is before he and Tom Patchett had gotten together. He was a genius. Yeah. Genius. Uh, and, uh, still around. Remember... Still looks great. I, I run into him not often, but I saw Jamie's brother a couple of months ago. It's unfortunate she passed away. She was a sweet, mm -hmm. sweetheart. Nice woman. That's all I had to say. That's funny, though. Yeah. But uh, um, I'm going to watch your back. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you're around, I watch my back. You know that. <laughs> but um, who used to always talk to you outside the theater? I always talk to you, right? Um, it was brief. I remember um, one time I met up with you and, and uh, uh, Shecky had called me and asked if I had, had collected any old, older academy award footage um the academy and, awards or and, 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 it, and it turns out you had asked checky to ask if anybody had it uh it was it was prep work for dave oh, um, oh okay so i i i've i'm proud to have had some part in that fiasco <laughs> well i was going to tell you the story about when i worked on the academy awards that one picture of me and the oscar at the museum I, I I I produced the red carpet, which was a lot of fun, but it was just fun to have an executive producer credential at the Academy Awards, where the guards go, "Oh, sir, how are you, sir?" Yeah. I mean, really, it, it was very <laughs> interesting. The other thing I found interesting about working on the Academy Awards was they have a meteor a meteorological service that gives them weather reports every single day for a year leading up to the Oscars, because the decision to tent the red carpet or not is the biggest decision that's made on the award show. <laughs> and they they literally 365 days beforehand start tracking the weather patterns. It's crazy. So I'm doing the red carpet and they have all these big Oscar statues made out of, you know, molded plastic. And they're painted very flat. They they didn't look good. And I said, I, I don't like the paint job on these. And the scenic designer said, yeah, but we have, you know, 700 of them around the theater. I go, well, the ones I'm using on air are horrible. They look they, like a flat gold. I said, I want it to have a little sheen. I want them to, to sparkle a little bit. So he painted it. And the people that ran the academy saw how great they looked. And he had to paint all the awards a couple of nights before, all this new shiny gold, and he called it Morty Gold. No. <laughs> all those all those awards that you see on the set at the Academy Award is painted in Morty Gold. So that's my, my little legacy with the Oscars. <laughs> and coincidentally, Morty Gold is the name of my accountant. So that's, yeah, there you go. Right. Right. Uh, that's bonkers, man. And, and by the way, I'm going to throw this out there too. Dave has done an expert job of changing the narrative. He actually killed it at the Academy Awards. Again, the Gen X kid absolutely loved. I still, one of his jokes from that night, I still quote to this day. He actually did a really good job of it, but um, I appreciate the fact that. Uh, uh, I thought he, he did great. I I I I must say, as a as a producer, I I kind of sh I shook him up a little bit after he did his monologue. Do you know the story? I he's, don't. We told it before. After he did his monologue, he came backstage and he was like, "How was it? How was it?" And I said, "It was okay." And he was, "It was okay. It was just fucking okay." And he's quoted that many times. I've heard in interviews where it kind of shook him up and, and you know, he lost a little confidence after I didn't say it was great. But I was well, being honest, you know. And he, 
he got out there. He was great. He was great. That might be the case, but that was the year of Forrest Gump, and that was the year of Pulp Fiction, and it was the year. And I remember when 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 uh, Bender and Tarantino got up to accept the one time that they got to win an award, but because Forrest Gump cleaned up on everything else, and 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 uh, Bender was like, oh. You know, we're going to get off here really quick. I got to go take a leak really bad. And Dave walks up to the microphone right after and said, I've had to take a leak the last two hours. You don't hear me complaining. And it was just fantastic. So that was after the monologue. So there was some gold, some Morty gold after that. Uh, well, after it was that funny monologue. because Forrest Gump, obviously I knew Hanks very well. Yeah. Uh, I was friendly with Steve Tisch, who, who produced the movie. Yeah. And my friend Eric Roth wrote the movie. So it was, you know, I loved being backstage when they won and being the first ones to greet them all. It was, it was fun. I was, I was rooting for them. And you know something, the, 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 the fucking Academy made such a to-do about Dave bringing, you know, Tom Hanks up to do the stupid Patrick and roll out the red carpet. Hanks could care less. Hanks is the most chill guy you've ever met. You know, it was like, he knew he was going to win. <laughs> or, oh yeah like that that was one of those charmed things and, and it was such a i thought it was an awesome thing and by the way again for whatever reason the narrative uh you know that dave didn't do well but the next year when billy hosted dave did a remote from a plane looking down at billy hey billy you know uva oprah so so it was it was a fantastic moment it was pop culture it was dave following johnny but creating his but own not part of that that culture that was the difference and he's counterculture that's so, right. you know, having embraced the counterculture every now and then. It's, he didn't embarrass the awards. No. He didn't smirch their 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 legacy. He was, you know, doing what he did. If they didn't know that that's what he was going to do, they shouldn't have hired him. Right. You no, know, it, 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 it wasn't his fault. And and I, I kind of felt bad because Gil Cates, who who did the show, I was I was very close to his brother, Joe Cates. So I knew Gil. And right before the awards, Letterman wanted to fuck with him. And he said to me, Morty, I want you to go to Gil Cates and tell him that I'm not going to wear a tuxedo, that I want to do the show in a suit. <laughs> and I said, Dave, what do you want to do that for? I said, the guy's doing a show that a billion people watch, the biggest show ever. I said, a half hour before the show, you want to just, just fuck with him like that? He goes, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's just <laughs> so I felt badly. So I went up to Cates. I said, Gil, you got to take this with a grain of salt. <laughs> Letterman wanted to me to tell you that he's going to wear a suit, not a tuxedo tonight. <laughs> and Gil goes, yeah, yeah, all right, don't worry. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Gil, he got it instantly. And it was it was just one of those things that you go, oh, God, why do you have to fuck with people? If yeah. that isn't a story that encapsulated who you were and what you did, I don't know yeah, what exactly. it does. Exactly. That's that's it right there. You balancing that line and doing what you're supposed to do, but at the same time trying to preserve these relationships and these other things here. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know a better example of that. I'm yeah. going to finish this show the way I finished the first 15 episodes um, because, I mean, I'm fascinated to know um, – God, we didn't even get into the... I wanted to talk to you about real estate in LA. I wanted to talk to you about what you're doing now, but you got to come back on and we're going to... We'll, There's we'll, nothing we'll, interesting about it. Oh, I see. I can pick your brain about it and I bet you I could make it interesting. No, I've got a picture of Josh toilet show, because of you, sir. You know, I represent some famous people. I show famous people houses. I, you know, I see the greatest houses in the world. I, you know, it's fun. You yeah. see how, how these stars live. You go through their closets. You see, they hide their Oscars on open houses so nobody sees it. It's fun, you know. And I got to see a picture of Jaja's toilet because of you. Um, so okay, we'll talk more about this the next time. I can't thank you enough. Uh, let's pleasure. finish off by let's finish off by saying, okay, Dave's doing the long form. He's doing the Tom Snyder thing now, and it's great. Doing a great job of getting the young audience because he gets pop culture icons of today. We get it. The strategy's awesome. He's amazing. If there were three people that you could see Dave do uh, a my next guest treatment with, who would they be? I'm fascinated to know who you'd like to see Dave talk to today. Uh, Steve Martin. Did he have Steve Martin on yet? Not yet. That's a great. Yeah. I, a, I love him and Steve together. The two of yeah. them together are two of the brightest guys I've ever known. Yeah. I'd love to see him 
anybody that sparks his curiosity because the curiosity, you know, the way to book that show is to bring on, you know, when he did, you know, uh, Zelensky. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, it, his curiosity was so acute and, and, and it made that interview so, so wonderful. Yep. Uh, you know, anybody that, you know, and, and, and he's, he's so interesting because, you know, he'll read a book and just be so curious and it could be a book about medicine it could be you know i'd love to see him talk to a doctor when he talks about medicine you know I, i'd like to see fauci on that show i'd love to see him talk to fauci that's a great you know, answer he had so much to talk to fauci about just just his curiosity about medical procedures i remember how great he was when when he had the heart surgery yeah just, just you know how he loved those doctors and those nurses and you know it shows a side of him that's that's you, you don't see when he does comedy. No, so I would say a Fauci. I, I would say a Steve Martin. I'd say, you know, I'd love to see him with a great director. You know, not Spielberg. Uh, I don't know. How about a JJ or someone like that? Wes Anderson. Wes Anderson. Anderson. There, there you, go. you go. Wes Anderson. That's a good, good. one. I'd love to see him with Wes Anderson. Excellent choice. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm Thomas gonna hit Stan. He loves movies. He loves movies. You know. Yeah. Don, you got anything I'm else? Sam Sterling I... Hayden, for God's sakes, who died 15 years ago. <laughs> Don, now, you got anything else for Morty? No, I'll just stay up. Uh, uh, remembering when Morty called me a schmuck. <laughs> we'll all remember that, and we'll uh, throw lots Don, of. Uh... You know, I adore you. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um. Robert, thank you for taking time to do this My with us. Thank you the last time. For, thank you for being so persistent. I I, I appreciate it. Oh well, so you knew I, will I be, was going to do it eventually, right? I used to describe our interactions as you uh, as a cat playing with a rubber mouse, and 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 I love that, and I appreciate it very very much. Worth the wait. Um, thank you very very much for doing this. I'm going to hit stop right now. We'll say our goodbye privately. Uh, Robert Morton, everybody, and Don Giller, for that matter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I couldn't just let it go right there. As you know, uh, I, I, I'm a blowhard that likes the sound of my own voice. And uh, uh, just so grateful for Morty. Um, it was an epic conversation. Now I'm going to, I'm just, I'll, I'll do a little bit of inside baseball here. Not, not very much and not the content, but just the, uh, uh, the, the tease, I don't know if it's a tease, but at this point, is anybody teased? I think everybody's probably pretty full right now. It was a very satisfying conversation, very satisfying episode with uh, teasers for more. Uh, I've got some ideas uh, of ways that we can, we can do some, some, some fun things uh, with Morty and, and, and utilize that vault of stories that he has. Um, but I'll let you know, we hit stop. Uh, and then Don, Morty, and I talked for like another 90 minutes after that. It was it was just so cool to be so free and easy uh, talking about some of these things. Um, but I'm really grateful that we got a lot of these stories on. The Disney thing, I, I, I'm just blown away by that still. Can you imagine a world where Disney owned worldwide pants? I'm very, I'm, I'm extremely grateful that, that, that Dave and company right now have the autonomy that they do with um, their material, um, with their catalog. It's, it's unique. It'll never be seen again. If they would have been purchased by Disney, it probably wouldn't have been, it, you know, that would have ended uh, what we have now. But at the end of the day, thinking about the road that could have been, uh, that is a very interesting road, that one there in particular. Uh, I love that that Morty still keeps up with Dave to the point where he can kind of expertly say, ah, yeah, Steve Martin, that would be a good one. Fauci, that'd be a good one. Like, like the idea of Dave doing the long form here, um, the 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 connection back to Tom Snyder, of course, um, and and the fact that um, you know, you really look at two of the greatest broadcasters of all time, you and and, and you know, in Tom Snyder and Johnny Carson, and Dave has kind of done both to his version of perfection. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just really, really grateful that uh, uh, we've had a chance to talk to, to Morty about this stuff. And I hope for, for, for stuff in the future. Um, if this last week, I hope you've had a chance to watch the very last late show with David Letterman and uh, um, come join the fun. 
uh, with us talking about this stuff, reminiscing, keeping this stuff alive, because at the end of the day, the content is still so good. And some of it was only seen, you know, once. Um, it's great to be a part of this. I really, really enjoy it. Uh, this was a monumental episode for us, uh, for me personally. I'm just, uh, I don't know where it's going to go uh, professionally, but at the end of the day, personally, you just can't, you can't take away this, this is unbelievable, unique um, feeling that I get in having these conversations. And, and uh, thank you for coming along uh, for the ride with us. Thank you so much for everybody who's interacted with us. The alpha uh, consumers who have jumped back, jumped out right away and, and, and actually, um, you know, interacted, um, you know, please come to the Facebook group interact with us there. Uh, I know a lot of people have reached out to me privately and, and, and I thank you for all of the hints and the help and, uh, people who have, who have reached out to help me and, and build, um, connections and relationships with people. I know this isn't our anniversary episode. Our anniversary episode was last month, but, uh, this kind of feels like one, it just, it, it was a big moment for us, uh, having Morty on. And, um, I hope that, uh, we hit the ball, uh, you know, at least we got on base, if not, if not more, more so, um, if it wasn't a home run, might have been a triple. Uh, I hope that was that way for you as well. And 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 the next time uh, we have him on, we're, we'll be even better. I'll have even better a setup. We'll have a better technological setup. We'll make it even uh, you know even even more special. Um, but I'm very grateful for this, and I, I I I don't like an episode to go by where I don't talk about how grateful uh, I am for this whole thing. Please take part. Please interact. Like, share, subscribe. Of course, Rupert G. The Hello Deli. Uh, what, what a re revelation that was. That was funny. I'm I'm curious to hear Rupert's reaction to that. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna wait for him to hear it in the episode, and then I want to talk to him about it. But uh, uh, yeah, that is another episode of the Letterman Podcast. We got plenty more coming. This isn't like it's the last one or anything. We got lots more coming. We got some in the can already, and uh, some special guests that are coming that uh, I just haven't announced yet. But it's coming. Uh, thank you very much for everyone out there. Once again, this has been the Letterman Podcast with Mike Chisholm. Coincidentally, I am Mike Chisholm. Thank you and good night. Overcoat and underpants.